Hello, my name is Ari Shapiro, and this is an overview of the Rapid Avatar project to date, and it is uh, December 2016. Um, we started with the Rapid Avatar project uh, being very interested in the depth sensors. Uh, this is a project from a few years ago where we essentially scan a person with a single Microsoft Connect uh, standing at four different poses at 90 degrees each. And uh, after about a minute of capture, it takes about two minutes of processing, but the end result is a 3D model that looks like you with an avatar that's wearing the clothes that you're wearing. Um, and it's very interesting to think about how this might change the economics of avatar creation. Your avatar becomes not a one-time construct, but a, um, a representation of what you're wearing today, the way you look today. Uh, we can connect this avatar to our animation system, uh, Smart Body, and we can essentially make this avatar move and function in simulation for with only another minute's worth of, uh, of, of time and a few button presses. So essentially within four minutes we've gone from uh, standing in a room and seeing ourselves inside of a simulation. Um, and with uh, 20 million or more connects distributed around the, the world um, right now, and probably even more than that, um, I think it's interesting to think about the possibilities. You know, what if you could capture yourself and put yourself inside of a simulation or game? Uh, what would the possibilities be? Uh, what could you do, and why would it even matter? Um, so people get very excited when they see their own avatar, and they get even more excited when they see their avatar move. The next thing that people say is, "Okay, that's great, but it doesn't move like me." And then we realize very quickly that uh, we need to capture more than just the appearance of a person in order to model an effective avatar of them, right? Um, everybody has a different way that they stand, the way that they talk, their their posture, their gestures, their responses to the environment, and it, it's, it's an interesting question to think about. Um, what aspects of a person do you need to model in order to create an avatar of that person such that it is an effective representation of that person? So once we did this, our next effort was to uh, do a gesture study. So we, we made avatars that have two different people. We captured their gestural style. Um, we played videos of each avatar with their own gestural style and with each other's gestural style. And then we performed a study asking people which one was a better representation. And then we got back the, the result that we expected, which is when you match the avatar to the gesture, um, it is a better representation than mismatching it. Um, so that remains an open question. If you uh, get the pants wrong, on the avatar, nobody cares. If you get the face wrong, people reject this avatar. They think it's horrible, it's monstrous, and they want nothing to do with it. So we began looking at um, face scanning. So this is an example of using face scanning with um, a commodity depth sensor like the Kinect. This was the occipital structure sensor. Uh, the texture quality is better because it's going through the iPad's camera. Um, and on the left, what you see is eight static expressive poses of my face. And on the right, you have real me driving the virtual me on the left. Um, so I would argue that at this point, the digital model that you see would actually be effective for a number of different um, uh, environments, uh, like video chat or, um, or games or simulations where it's important to recognize me as me. Um, uh, and this is done with, a again, a commodity sensor you can buy for about $300 and a near automatic process for producing the, the facial model, the blend shapes. This is another experiment that we did. Uh, this is with uh, Intel RealSense sensor. So, so this is a $100 sensor. And you can see that the texture quality, the color quality is a little bit worse, but it's still a photorealistic representation of the, uh, of the capture subject. And um, um, even though the color is a little bit off, it's, uh, I would still argue that this is a, an excellent representation of them. Again, this is with a $100 sensor and a near automatic process. And of course, once the data is digital, you can start changing who is the puppeteer and who is a controlled model. So in this case, we have um, my intern's friend uh, puppeteering uh, his face. Um, so the possibilities are, are certainly open. Once we got the quality of the faces to this level, we needed to look back at our body scanning, so the original Connect model that I showed you before, it wasn't particularly high quality, mainly because the, uh, the Connect scanner is not particularly high quality. We're, just, we're using it in a way where we're capturing something at a distance. So that was the motivation behind bringing in photogrammetry. 
So these are, I'll we'll have to run that again using a different player. So what I'm showing you here, these are photogrammetry scans from a uh, Raspberry Pi based photogrammetry scanner. So what it is, is 100 Raspberry Pis uh, connected with 100 Raspberry Pi cameras. And so the whole, the equipment costs us about, say about 12 or $13,000. Um, but we produce imagery that looks like this, and this is with about uh, five or six minutes of uh, photogrammetric, photogrammetric reconstruction with uh, Agisoft PhotoScan. Um, and you might not know who these people are, but you can you could probably bet that this is how they look. So um, the quality that you're seeing with the bodies here roughly matches the quality of the faces that I, I showed you before. Um, so now that we have both of these. Um, we're getting closer to putting together a, a photorealistic avatar. Um, but the key here is not that we can produce a, a model of high quality. The, uh, the 3D uh, sector can already do this. If you look at digital doubles for movies or film, uh, a digital double in a film can be a very, very compelling representation of a real person. The issue here is cost. Um, it can cost a million dollars a minute to do high-end visual effects. It can cost several hundred thousand dollars to create a hero character for a video game. And what we're trying to do is to create these avatars with uh, low or near zero cost, right? So once we have these body models of, of this quality, uh, we also need to look back at some of the algorithms that we used before. So originally, our algorithm for automatic rigging was done using SmartBody, which had a uh, sphere packing algorithm. So you essentially pack spheres into the character and then rig it that way. And that's not accurate enough when you get to this quality. Uh, so we put together um, another uh, rigging system. So this is based on a deformable model. So here we have a set of models. This is from the SCAPE database. We have a thousand men and a thousand women. Um, each of these models has a, a similar topology, um, same number of vertices, and they're corresponding to each other. We rig one of those uh, models, and then we find a correspondence between some set of models and our original scan. And with that, we can start to transfer over the bone position and the skin weights. So essentially, at this point, we've automatically rigged our skeleton. And then the other fun thing that you can do is once we have this rigged and we know the relationship, we can start playing around with the statistics of how people's bodies um, are correlated with each other. So what if I was fatter or shorter or taller or skinnier? Um, and I'm deriving this data from the data from our model database, right? So shorter, fatter people have a certain proportion to their limbs, a certain shape and size. Taller, skinnier people likewise, or taller, stronger, or, or, or what have you. And I can apply these changes back to my scan. So there's some interesting body imagery applications that could be uh, generated from this. Um, and there might even be a, an analog for digital uh, modifying the digital face. So if you had a database of different faces, perhaps you could do something equivalent to digital plastic surgery. What would it look like if my face were changed in, in the following ways? Um, another, uh, another thing to pay attention to is uh, usually with these photogrammetry scans, it's very difficult to get a lot of detail in the hands. Um, so what we did was we also added a morphable hand model. So here we do the first pass of uh, attaching the model to the to the scan and now we attach a hand model with, with fingers that can articulate and, and wrists that can move um, and we morph it to the position of the scan subject and once we do that we now have hands that can actually be used we copy over the textures and essentially now we have fingers that can be that can do things that ordinarily you wouldn't be able to do just with the scan so this is where we uh, we stand with our um, uh, with our pipeline. So let me advance forward a little bit here. Okay, so the process is like this. So first, what we do is we do a photogrammetric scan with our capture cage. We do a reconstruction, which I mentioned takes about five six minutes. Um, here is our face scanning system. So we're essentially using a single depth sensor to capture different facial expressions. Each facial expression capture takes about 15 seconds. Behind the scenes, the important thing is to register the faces together and produce blend shapes so we have an automatic process which will find corresponding parts of the faces 
um, register them together, and then create uh, proper, blend, proper blend shapes. And you can see, for example, in this, uh, in this blend, you can see the blood flowing in the cheeks, which is important for photorealism. Here is the auto-rigging uh, software that we showed you before to automatically rig the character. Um, and then once we do this, once we do the hand rigging, uh, we essentially have created a body model and a face model. Now what we need to do is we need to take the face model and uh, connect it to the body model. So we take the face model, automatically determine where the body's model's face is, uh, stitch it on, color correct, and what we end up with is a photorealistic 3D character that looks like you using your facial expressions in about 20-25 uh, minutes with no artistic intervention and no technical intervention and suitable of, of approximately this quality for use in various different applications like video games or perhaps chat or virtual reality or whatnot. Um, and I think this is interesting to the extent that um, if the process is near automatic and the cost is near zero, then it opens up the possibility of having these avatars almost everywhere, right? And then the question becomes, okay, so aside from narcissism and ego, What's the real value of this in the first place? Um, does it matter that uh, you have an avatar that could that is you, or does it change anything? Or well, what does it affect other than other than us enjoying seeing pictures of us <laughs> because we live in that, that sort of era? So this is from a study that we did. We scanned 100 people. Um, we put them inside of a maze simulation. We either gave them their own doppelganger to to control in the simulation, or we gave them a control, which was a different doppelganger of the same gender. And we tried to figure out, is it the case that people would change their behavior if they use their own doppelganger? So in other words, um, you've got a maze game where you have landmines that you can step on, and you've got walls that you can bump into. Would you be more careful if you were controlling your own avatar? There's some sort of ownership or protection that you would give over them. Or did it change it in any other way? So um, we really wanted to, to come up with some sort of conclusion that says, yes, yes, it does affect it, but we didn't find that. We didn't find the, uh, the change in behavior. So people weren't actually more careful with their own avatars than they were with others. Um, what they were is more interested. So when you do these subjective, uh, these, when you ask these subjective questions, such as, did you enjoy it? Did you, um, did you feel connected to the avatar? The answer was yes. So there does seem to be some value to having your own avatar inside the simulation. Um, although for our test it didn't affect how they, how they uh, performed in the game, it did change their interest. So, um, you know, looking forward, we'd like to find other uh, values of having this digital avatar. All right, so that's the summary of our Rapid Avatar uh, project. And uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please email. Thank you.